Right. So that's me. Um, that, by the way, is a very, very cute little origami elephant that we have in our London offices. Uh, I, I kind of like using this because one of the big challenges uh, with a lot of data processing is actually making sense of it. Uh, anyone can collect a large amount of data or a square, flat piece of paper. Not everyone has the skill set to turn it into one of those. Uh, so hopefully uh, I'll, I'll show you a few of the tools which make it a little easier to produce some data origami by the end of the day. The first thing I want to talk to you is really about it's a big problem. We had a lot of talk in the keynote about the growth of computation and you, know, you get those GPU things. And uh, by the way, that, that training the model time, if you have a really fast PC, I still reckon you could do that in a week. Because if you have an NVIDIA DX1, because you happen to have a quarter of a million dollars burning a hole in your pocket, then you can train things much faster. And you've got this huge computational ability. However, the thing that hasn't really changed very much is the network connectivity to get to that huge computation. Uh, cloud provides you access to that computation, I think, for, um, oh, what's it cost? It's about, yeah, for about $12 an hour, you can hire one of those quarter of a million bits of kit with, uh, yeah, eight GPUs and, uh, what's that, about 16,000 GPU cores in it. That's a pretty hefty big bit of kit. But you can't get all your data to it. That's because of a uh, yeah, phenomenon which um, I didn't coin this, I'm afraid. Uh, I, I forget who originally came up with this, but it's quite a popular topic. It's data gravity. Much like you can't bring Jupiter to Earth to study it, we have to send the devices over there to go and have a look at it. Very much the same kind of principle holds with your data. Because while it might be uh, only 58 million Kilo uh, sorry, 588 million kilometers to get to Jupiter. Uh, it's still quite a long way for your data to get from a device in a field, say, uh, or a device on a car to a data center in California, for example. What is it? About 120 milliseconds odd. It's about the fastest you can get to California. So. You have to often send. You still have to send the computation to the data. There are other kinds of data gravity that tend to impact us as well. So yeah, the, the biggest problem for trying to combine a lot of data and generate the kind of data sets that we need to be able to learn uh, you know, and train very large traditional deep learning models are really around uh, you have these things called nation states, which still exist, and pesky things like borders and compliance and regulations, and also actually, of course, the ethics of using that, the, the motivating forces behind those things. So one of the biggest problems, and yeah, this is something which is increasing these days as well, with the uh, beginnings of regulations like uh, GDPR in the EU, for example, it's becoming much harder to move data around. Uh, if you've ever worked on data sets from China, then you've worked from on them in China, uh, for example. It's very difficult to get personalized data for things like autonomous vehicle projects out of countries like China. Uh, but they have very large data sets which are very valuable for training. So you have to be able to be aware of the fact that often the data can't be moved. Uh, and there are all sorts of uh, fun and creative barriers that uh, legislation and the lawyers will put in front of you to try and you know, get data into a processable form. The other thing is, of course, the growing trend of using cloud. You know, we talked about those, uh, you know, renting those big GPU boxes in cloud. And uh, Still, today, there are plenty of organizations who will be too paranoid to allow their data to ever leave the door, their physical doors. So there's still a, a perception gap in, in uh, what I would call data security around this that we have to deal with, uh, which requires us to take computation to the data uh, instead of the other way around. So, data gravity. The before this kind of word like the word anymore, to be honest, it's really very, very dated. Uh, yeah, everyone just sampled things, and we sent around samples instead. Or yeah, we had single node machines. Um, most people still probably working in data science are still focusing on single node machines, for example, and the capacity of a single GPU box or a single CPU box, uh, for example. How many people ac actively use a, a clustered environment at the moment for their work? Okay, so about a third, maybe, if I'm being generous. Uh, most people still do most of their work on single machines, 
which means they're subject to things like sampling down to the capacity of those single machines. Even with this growth of computation and the growth of storage and the growth of connectivity, you're still not able to fit that many terabytes of, machine, of, of data onto a single machine. Of course, before all this stuff, we had, um, you know, we had other means of dealing with this problem. We had things like message passing architectures. We had the grid computing. We had supercomputers, uh, or at least you did if you have a Met Office, for example, uh, or NASA. Uh, but these were not so accessible. Now, they are. They're much more accessible. The cloud has made it possible for pretty much anyone in this room on a Sunday afternoon. I, I spun up a quick cluster. Uh, yesterday because I was playing around with some new uh, face detection libraries, um, which didn't work, unfortunately. But the process of uh, spinning all that up cost me about a fiver, and I had a fairly decent-sized cluster going there, a you know, decent eight-node cluster for about a fiver. Um, so I no longer have to sample my data to be able to process it on my laptop, which is just as well because the poor thing's already so full it can barely present on the screen. So nowadays, we don't really have to do that, except we do. Because of this data gravity problem, we have to be a little bit more discerning about what data we do actually process, what data we try and move, and how we actually make the decision on what is worth spending all that expensive compute on. So I'm going to introduce you to a tool that, um, yeah, that we have been supporting for some time. It's an open source tool. It's an Apache project. Uh, it's uh, called uh, NiFi. And what it is is essentially a data flow tool. And it has some very nice properties for managing the state of gravity problem. Uh, but it is, uh, yeah, having said all this stuff about how we can't move data, it is pretty much all about moving data. Uh, the point about it, though, is that it's also about moving data selectively and carefully. Uh, one of its key strengths is this ability to uh, yeah, command and control the data, but also prioritize and queue it. So I can start to use tools like this to make intelligent decisions at the edge as to what data I start to bring into my more uh, elaborate machine learning uh, environments. The other thing about it is it has lots of adapters. Um, and yeah, it's also very, very handy for bringing in random data from all over the place, which makes it extremely powerful as an edge tool uh, to be able to bring in data from wherever it happens to be into wherever you want to happen to process it. It's also very easy to write additional adapters as well. So I'm going to show you a few that, uh, that I knocked up over the weekend. So without further ado, I just want to show it to you very quickly. And we're going to look at a very, is my cursor gone? OK, I can't actually see my cursor on this screen. So this is going to get interesting. I will guess where it is. So this is a um, this is a uh, a flow data flow. It's a very visual environment. Uh, I just click these things together. Oh wow! Okay. Um, can I get? Do you know why my cursor isn't here? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know what? I bet it's PowerPoint's yeah. fault. It's always PowerPoint's fault. It's a horrible thing. Yeah, there you go. Right. Okay. Um, so I can do, uh, yeah, here's one of my custom processes. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, no, you don't see, it. You don't see oh. arrangement, mirror, there you go. All right. And now it's bigger. There you go. So very visual environment. Uh, this thing will run on an edge device. I, I have it running on things like Raspberry Pis, so you know, it's quite good for collection right out of the edge. In this instance, I'm running everything locally because I, yeah. Remember that thing about gravity and connectivity? Really don't trust Wi-Fi ever in these kind of environments. So it's all running locally, but we're going to simulate a full connection environment. So what I'm doing now is I'm just grabbing frames off of my camera. Uh, you see there, and uh, you can see um, I've queued up a few frames. I haven't started a full flow yet. So let's see how bad I'm looking. OK, that's not going to be great for facial detection. Um, actually, it probably will <laughs> find something in there. Um, but yeah, so I'm just grabbing frames off of my video at the moment. Um, 
one of the other things I'm doing is then tagging that with a bunch of metadata at the edge. So I can start to tag things like origin. Yeah, this is not this is not the intelligence stage yet, but it's all useful context to add to that. So in this instance, I'm just actually giving it a not very interesting random file name. Um, so just start that up, and uh, yeah, that's it. Oh no, right? You see, it's all it's all handling all the queuing quite nicely. If I now enable this to transmit, then it can send it up to my pseudo cloud or my pseudo local collector, which also happens to be running on this laptop, but let's not talk about that. It could be in the cloud. Um, so that's very simple data transfer technology. Um, when it gets more interesting is when we start doing things like facial detection in it. So yeah, we saw that you know, trivial, trivial example of just moving data around. So far, so good. I mean, at least it's better than having yeah, hundreds of Python scripts that you have to use for data ingest, for example. What I'm now going to do is apply some facial detection on that so that we can be more intelligent about the data that we bother to move around. So um, yeah, how many people have played with facial detection libraries at all? Okay, so brief introduction to facial detection. It's been one of the things which has been going for a, quite a while in uh, the machine learning world. Computer vision is obviously quite a hot topic. Uh, and so there's quite a history of work on this, quite a history of different algorithms for this as well. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to start by using some of the old fashioned ones. And by old fashioned, I mean, ooh, nearly 10 years old. Um, uh, I'm then going to show how we can progressively use more complex and larger models to make decisions along the path of moving data so that we can save some of that precious and expensive uh, mobile bandwidth, for example. So the way a lot of facial detection works is it looks for key points on the face. Uh, yeah, well, the early facial detection will look for things like gradients. So it's going to find back gradient. It's going to find an edge around there or around the pupil, for example. And it's going to start determining the structure and shape of a face uh, using something like uh, what, what's called hog classifiers. Uh, so it's based on histogram of gradients, that's what it stands for. And it finds edges, essentially. So it's going to find the edges around there. Uh, I particularly like this image as a sample for this because almost every facial detection algorithm fails on this image uh, because it can't see a large enough chunk of face. Had I cropped in, had I cropped in a little bit more forehead, then it might just have figured it out. One of the reasons for that is that a lot of the algorithms focus on detection of key points. The, um, uh, one of the more popular libraries for this is one called Dlib, uh, which has a standard model that ships with it, which is based on a standard model of a human face, which has 68 key points that it detects in the face. One of which is there, 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 and there. So if it can't find eyebrows, it really struggles to find a face. <laughs> But the point about this is what I want to do is I want to, I want to use those images I've got at the edge and do a very, very cheap version of facial detection on them. So what I'm going to do is figure out, you know, okay, if I can do the cheap version first, it might be worth getting more context and doing a more detailed an analysis of this. So let's have a look at how we do that. So I'm going to go back to the NiFi. I'm going to use um, a NiFi processor that I knocked up one weekend. Uh, and yeah, it's very, very simple. It's using the Har Cascader method in a library called OpenCV. Uh, OpenCV is Open Computer Vision. It's one of the kind of go-to standards for uh, computer vision libraries, and it has nice bindings for things. I'm just written in C, so it's reasonably quick. Uh, it has nice bindings for Python and Java and yeah, all the other things you can think of. It also has some of these uh, yeah, very, very fast, uh, quite old algorithms in it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to my NiFi. I'm actually going to go now to the one that's magically in the cloud, not just on my laptop, but is actually just on my laptop. And you can see what's happened here is, uh, you remember that thing that was sending stuff? That's all appearing here. Is that large enough at the back? Can anyone see that? If I, um, if I zoom that in a bit. Right, so I'm getting pictures from my local laptop camera in there. I then run my Har Cascader. And this is, uh, oh, sorry, no, that's a group. And have a look at my little. This is effectively a function, right? And I've written my function. Uh, most most machine learning uh, computer vision things seem to start with some form of resizing, uh, or uh, in the neural network world, some sort of pooling. Uh, there are several reasons for this. Firstly, these things are really cheap and cover and tend to cover the images and noise. The second thing is that the sheer computational 
uh, power required to process a high def camera frame is still beyond something of the size of this and mostly beyond even some of the GPU type things. If you look at something like a very large neural network model, for example, then you might be able to process it at about sort of, uh, oh, there's a great paper on this I read this morning about uh, a new algorithm that had managed to get it down to, or, or get it up to rather, about 10 frames per second processing on a network card that costs about a thousand quid. So, sorry, not network card, a uh, GPU, a graphics card that costs about a thousand quid. So, yeah, you're still struggling to process the volume of a full, def, uh, yeah, full definition image off of just a cheap webcam and a laptop. So, you often start with a resizing step. Uh, the more interesting thing here is now uh, yeah, the extract faces step. And you see, I've run quite a few of these through here now. I suspect that. Um, some of these are going to show up soon enough. I found 11 images here that don't have a face in. Uh, let's just check that that was sort of rightish. Uh, oh, no, it has, hasn't got a face in, so it's just throwing them away. Perfect. I don't care about those. I only care about images that have faces in. So let's have a look at ones where it did actually find a face. And it's also throwing those, or rather sent those to the next step. Uh, so. I've got my images with faces. I've also extracted a bunch of faces. Let me just actually stop that for a second, and we'll let things queue up. Okay, so it's found a face. It's found an image with a face. Let's just check that it got that sort of right. That's got some faces. <laughs> <laughs> NiFi itself has a face. You know, there you go. <laughs> um, but, you know, essentially what I can now assume is that this image is moderately interesting. So I've made a pretty bad guess that it's got a face in, but I've actually tuned it to, uh, yeah, for a false positive in this scenario. So it's now actually worth looking at this and maybe doing it properly. So off it goes, off up to the next piece. Um, the other thing that this does is actually I didn't show you all of those images uh, from the provenance piece, but it also extracts these uh, you know, small chunks of a face. So it will just, yeah, if you've got very limited bandwidth, for example, then what I can do is I can say, okay, just send the faces, get round to all the context, get round to all the detailed information later. Uh, yeah, if you happen to have bandwidth or you happen to feel like it. So the next step is to do something a little bit more intelligent with this. Uh, to use a, a deeper model. Now, that model that I used uh, to do the Haar Cascade lookup is represented by about 700K or so of XML, which is an extremely wordy way of representing what's actually quite a small model. Um, it, like I say, OpenCV's been around for a while, so they still use XML. Um, the model I'm using and training here uh, to detect these points is around about 100 meg. So you see these models start to get much larger and they start to need, need a lot more computation. So I'm having to shift this off onto a larger machine than, say, my tiny little embedded Raspberry Pi I could run the first step on. So this is a this is DLib-based model. Um, you know, the observant among you will notice that this was actually run in a, uh, in a Jupyter notebook. And so you know, you'll, rec you'll recognize the beautiful plotting of matplotlib and the way it represents images in a strangely scaled way. Um, this uh, actually runs for me in a, uh, in a Hadoop cluster in the cloud. Uh, so yeah, this gives me a lot more processing power. It gives me the capability to not only extract these kind of things, but then run classifiers on the metrics between these facial points to start to actually recognize these people as well. Now to do that, I need a fairly sizable database. Oh, sorry, uh, before I go on to that, I wanted to bring up uh, yeah, another sort of newer class and some of them uh, additional progress beyond yeah, things like that, uh, things like the DLib model and things like those kind of, you know, um, classifier models based on facial location points. Has everybody heard of TensorFlow? Uh, yeah. <laughs> if we look at uh, some of the progress that's been made in applying neural networks to this problem, then they rely very heavily on convolution. Uh, yeah, convolutional neural networks have been very, very effective for 
the feature extraction element of face detection. So you remember the first point I was pointing out how you know, the hog algorithm extracts gradients and edges in an image. It's just feature detection, right? It's feature, you know, all facial <coughs> detection things are really just a, a bunch of feature engineering and a very simple classifier. Same principle for networks like, uh, yeah, where is it, FaceNet, uh, which instead of using uh, the, the kind of heavily architected and manually produced feature sets like, uh, like HOG, for example, or the SIFT or SURF algorithms, you have these kind of human engineered algorithms, they're essentially relying on convolution and uh, pooling to generate feature sets out of, to generate latent features out of a neural network instead of uh, a kind of handcrafted algorithm or a human intuition based algorithm. They then all run into very similar kind of classifiers with the same kind of destination points. The difference is, of course, that um, you know, when we're running our carefully purpose-crafted algorithms for facial detection, we tend to represent them as very small amounts or very small models, and they're very, very simple. And as we saw, they do a great job of finding things that aren't faces. Uh, when you start getting up to things like the TensorFlow models and these convolutional neural nets, FaceNet is a model of, uh, what is it? It's quite a small model by neural network standards. It's, uh, it, it's five sets of convolution and pooling levels, and then a couple of other levels, and then a softmax classifier. So it's, uh, in neural network world, that is quite a small network. Yeah, it's, what, 12 layers. Uh, Inception, which is the famous one that does all the object detection stuff, is a series of three networks, each of which have, uh, I've forgotten how many layers, but it adds up to quite a lot of layers. So these are quite big networks. FaceNet, once you've gzipped it up uh, in a binary format, as opposed to the you know, wasteful XML approach, is 168 megabytes, which is the sort of model you can still just about fit in a phone, uh, but you can't fit it in an embedded device. So that's why you have this, you also have this kind of data gravity problem associated with the models themselves as well both in terms of the sheer size of the weight matrix uh, of a model, but also in terms of the computability of that. Because, of course, yeah, every time you're scoring that, it's, yeah, it's going through all those weights. That's a lot of calculation uh, to do on a very small field device. Um, the, what I did want to point out here, though, is that uh, I can still use this as part of my decision-making process on, say, larger devices. If I have uh, something like a car, it's got more computing than something like a phone. If I have something like um, yeah, a, a regional thing or just my laptop, for example, that's quite capable of doing yeah, 168 meg worth of compute in a reasonable time. So we went and shoved it into our data processing technology so we could start to make decisions on that as well. So I'm going to show you that very quickly case nobody believes me. So one, uh, this is, uh, again, this is um, available online. This is actually just written by a colleague of mine and uh, yeah, extensively adapted over the course of the last few weeks uh, by me. But what I can do is just throw these uh, TensorFlow models into this decision-making piece as well to control how I'm routing and guiding my data. So let's... Um, Let's just get that one started. I'm just going to grab something from a file here and just start up my TensorFlow profiler. Uh, this TensorFlow model, by the way, very simple. I just give it a model. As it happens, I happen to have put um, the Inception model in this. Uh, has everyone seen Inception, the, the model, not the film? So Inception is um, a reasonably, uh, reasonably famous model now. Uh, and uh, it's trained on uh, an object data set to classify pictures of objects. Uh, you may have seen around in the news recently one of its biggest challenges, and this is uh, you know, it's actually version of Inception that was used to back this paper. Uh, one of the big problems that Inception has is telling the difference between chihuahuas and muffins. Uh, but that's, uh, that's another aside. And to be honest, I mean, uh, if you if look up the paper, it's worth having a look. And, and test yourself, because a few of those chihuahuas look really tasty. <laughs> so, but what I am going to do is I'm just going to use one of the standard test images from that. And um, uh, oh, does everyone know what that is? 
Giant panda, right? Easy. Let's see how Google does. Uh, Inception, by the way, was originally written at Google. So uh, we're just going to dump that in there. And that is going to, uh, oh, yeah, it's gone. OK, right. And it's processing through here very, very fast. And it successfully identified that image. That's a good sign. Uh, so let's see what it identified it as. Uh, it, oh, I'll just have a look at the metadata on there. And it has successfully identified, but it's a giant panda. Fantastic. Uh, it's not a lesser panda, but that was a pretty close contender. So now, say I am uh, writing a system that's only, yeah, I, I, I own a zoo. Uh, I'm writing a system that's only really interested in the giant pandas. Uh, it couldn't care less about red pandas, however cute they are. Uh, but I'm now only going to route CCTV footage of my giant pandas into uh, yeah, my central processing uh, yeah, cluster because maybe I'm running the, the giant panda breeding program or something like that. I can now do that at the edge and send that off to a research institute, for example, based on that classification. Uh, but I've defeated my problem of having to send vast, vast quantities of video and just selectively pulled out the frames that matter. Um, so, the other problem and the other kind of data gravity related problem is how do you recognize that face? And we kind of went through labeling points and face was like, yeah, I know that's a face because that's an eye and that's an eye and that's a nose. I don't know that it's me yet. And I don't have enough data on my edge devices to know that it's me yet. So that's where I have to transfer it up to some kind of cloud system. Uh, I don't know if any of you watched the, um, the launch of the iPhone X. Um, the rather embarrassing moment where the phone failed to recognize its owner. Uh, so face authentication failed. Uh, it was later revealed that the reason for this was that so many people had tried it out backstage that they'd basically blown the memory of how many faces it could keep a record of. So it just, you know, there wasn't enough memory on the device to store that many faces. And sure, you can store you know, your family's faces and profiles uh, at, uh, what are they? They're doing like 10,000 points or something, or 30,000 points on a depth mask to do that. Uh, authentication. So it's quite a lot of, it's, it's, you know, it's not a lot of data in terms of you know, the, the kind of whatever it is, 64 gig you fit on a phone. But yeah, it does start to add up. And uh, so yeah, you can't keep a database of everyone in this room on your phone. You can't keep, a, or at least their fac facial profiles. You can't keep a database of everyone in the world, certainly. Um, not unless you're uh, the American government, I suspect. Um, so this is where it really makes, uh, this is where you want to make sure that you are sending these things up to the cloud. But you also want to send them up efficiently. So, you know, using those kind of edge detection mechanisms to start to do some of the feature extraction, for example, at, at the edge and then just send up features makes a lot of sense. Running the expensive classification layers at the end of a neural network, for example, makes sense when you need the full context of a full labeled set, for example or when you say you need to know more things about people. So yeah, if I'm a retailer and yeah, this guy walks in the store, then they're probably not going to do very well um, because you don't get paid that much for researching this stuff. Uh, but you know, if, someone, uh, if someone they recognize as a really loyal customer walks in, then yeah, they, they have all sorts of context information around that. That's not the sort of thing you can keep at in an edge device. So that's yeah, really about how you make that decision to send things up to a, a cloud environment. So let's use our NiFi thing again. Yeah, remember the thing about all the adapters? It's got a lot of great cloud adapters. It's very, very good at just shuffling data around, not having to write uh, your deal with the dozens of different APIs, because every cloud vendor wants you to use their API these days. Um, they're all different in very subtle and very lock-in friendly ways. Uh, but you have the open source step here kind of intercedes and gives you a, access to a variety of these things. Um, the cloud vendors have also realized that uh, one of the great advantages they have is that they've got enormous collections of information to train models on. So they have extremely good models uh, for processing uh, yeah, images. Uh, or images of faces, images of pandas, all these things, you know, cats even. Uh, they've learned how to detect cats. Uh, because they have these giant training sets and enormous amounts of compute, which frankly, none of us are going to reasonably be able to build within our organizations, I suspect, or at least I'm sure there are some exceptions in this room who have uh, you know, many, 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 many petabytes of data. 
No one owning up to that? Okay. Um, yeah, they've packaged all this up in a very nice, easy to use, easy to consume manner. But it also costs quite a bit to run. So yeah, if you look at um, Azure, for example, then I can pick up, uh, I can do 20,000 recognitions a month for free, which is very generous of them. Uh, after that, it starts to be billed at a few pence per thousand faces, which does start to add up very fast. When you're looking at doing things like face classification in video at 20, 24, 60 frames a second, then it starts to add up really fast because yeah, you don't get a lot of you don't get a lot of recognition or you don't get a lot of uh, video out of your 20,000 a month for sure. Uh, so that's where we have the kind of yeah, the advantage of being able to filter out some of those bits at the edge and yeah, do the kind of rough cut decision before we get to the cloud piece. So to show the cloud piece in action, here we have uh, yeah, our filtered out set. Let me just stop that one because I silly, feel foolishly use the same input point. And again, here is um, another processor. Uh, this is another one of mine, I'm afraid. If you have a look at my GitHub, you'll find all sorts of these little uh, weird and wonderful things. Uh, this is hooked up to my Azure account. All you need is a subscription key. Uh, I'm afraid you can't have mine, um, but you can just go onto Azure and get one for free. So let's see if uh, yeah, what we can get in terms of uh, a place that has genuinely large context on this sort of stuff. So yeah, remember this image? This is uh, me and uh, me and a slightly surprised-looking colleague uh, who. I was demoing some of this stuff too a while ago. So we'll just shove that in, wait for that to get picked up. And this will then manage all the orchestration of sending that image up to the cloud. It oh, it's done it. <laughs> okay. Um, and uh, it has done it, isn't it? That is that one. Yes, it has. There you go. Um, and that will give me much more information about this image. I think it's that one there. So yeah, you see I've got all the, all the facial points that's discovered there. Uh, but more to the point, because they have all that additional context and a much more complex available uh, model available to me, I've also detected that, yes, he was indeed surprised at how effective the demo was. Uh, so was I, actually, because it was the first time I'd run it when we took that image. And we also have some interesting kind of uh, quality metrics which come back from that. So, yeah, it's detective that that's a little overexposed. So yeah, that then provides me the ability to pull that out and do further routing on that. Maybe I'm only interested in actually storing the high quality images so I can use the same routing technology to um, make best use of my storage as well. So that's really the kind of, yeah, the way in which you progress through levels of complexity. Similarly, if you don't want to use a public cloud, using some of those TensorFlow models, embedding them in a technology like Spark on a large cluster provides you a bunch of benefits. TensorFlow does distribute itself. Uh, that said, it doesn't have all the kind of cluster management stuff that more mature um, clustering platforms have. So you know, it can often be a good idea to reuse existing uh, you know, environments which you've got available for other machine learning pieces as well as just TensorFlow. Um, I also wanted to broaden out some of these use cases from this kind of you know, facial detection thing. And um, one of the obvious ones for this is yeah, things like body-worn video. You have the cameras that you, uh, that you see on some of the police forces. Uh, yeah, originally, they wanted to record everything and have it all sent back to a central location. Uh, so the mobile network said things like, yeah, sure, no problem. That'll be um, how many billion? Uh, at which point they said, well, maybe not. Let's just record it when yeah, people remember to press the button. And we'll upload it by hand when the device arrives back at base. That's not great from uh, yeah from an intelligence gathering point of view or a safety point of view, and it kind of defeats the whole point of the things, which is to prevent people from, uh, you know, or to prevent corrupt policemen from conducting bad interviews because they just don't bother to record those ones. Uh, so this kind of edge detection and edge filtering provides the ability to push up only relevant information and save you an absolute fortune on mobile bandwidth in the billions. Um, an area particularly close to my own work is cybersecurity. This has the problem absolutely in spades the other way around. So if you think about um, cybersecurity, one of the things people really want to collect is the PCAP data, which is a record of every single byte that goes over your network. That gets pretty quick, uh, pretty large, pretty fast. Uh, we were talking to some people the other day who had 0.8 petabytes a day of data at each of their access points, of which they had many. 
Now that's actually a, that's a really hard problem to get down a wire. The other thing is, of course, if you're capturing everything that goes over the wire and then sending it over the same wire, physics kicks in. Um, so what we do is we use this, a very similar technique to this to do essentially a kind of rough cut first pass on some of the meta uh, metadata generated from that. We just send over a small set. The central platform that then has all the extra information, all the context, all the lists of bad guys and known bad guys and more complex models and lots of compute available to it, can then make a decision where it kind of goes, yeah, that rough cut looks kind of interesting, plus I've run this other stuff and yeah, there's some context around that, so it looks kind of interesting. You know what? Tell me more. So that's, uh, yeah, that's where, yeah, that, that's kind of architecture which really takes advantage of this kind of rough processing at the edge to then be able to make decisions on whether you need to make decisions. Uh, on an expensive core or over an expensive network. Um, so to summarize, um, what I'm demonstrating here is really a kind of progressive architecture which not only gives us a little bit of a history of how you know, these algorithms have developed but why some of them are still relevant. Uh, so you start out with something like a, you know, a, little, a low, low fidelity first pass model which gives you essentially the information, yeah, you know, it's probably worth carrying on with this process. Uh, you're going to be throwing away the vast majority of your uh, data at that point because most data is quite boring. Uh, sometimes it's very useful for that. Sometimes the boring stuff is really useful for baselining uh, learning algorithms, but generally speaking, a lot of it's quite dull. So filter it out at the edge. You can then start to bring in a little bit more complex technology to the stack to take that rough cut, refine it, start producing things like yeah, hashes of feature sets so that you can compare those against larger databases when, uh, yeah, when they happen to be available. Uh, start to use bigger machines which are able to handle hundreds of megabytes worth of model and do that kind of next pass step. But when it gets really interesting is when you then push that up to the kind of cloud scale type models where you're looking at models which are you know, many, many gigabytes worth of neural network, for example, many layers of neural network, huge complex GPU compute that you just can't carry around in your pocket, uh, and do, uh, as well as the kind of deep context which allows you to say things like, yes, that facial hash matches this person, uh, and yeah, do you know, more complex modeling around things like emotion detection as well. So uh, hopefully, that tool will be useful to you in kind of shuffling this data around and helping to root it and make decisions about, about where each of these levels of different model uh, are appropriate and work. But uh, I think that, that kind of, I, I just conclude by saying when you're thinking about artificial intelligence, don't just think about the one model. Think about the whole flow and the architecture of how you're going to get the data to that model and what you can do with different types and different levels and different accuracies of model as you go along that, uh, that pathway. So with that, thank you very much. Um, you can find me on. <laughs> thank you.